Hi, I'm Elaine Engelhart from Utah Valley University, and welcome to our discussions on democracy. Today, we're going to be discussing a very interesting topic that deals with our economic processes that have been going on since the turn of the 1900s. And with us today, we have a very distinguished scholar, Mark Sagoff, and also another distinguished scholar, David Keller. And David is from uh, Utah Valley University. He's a professor of philosophy and the director for the Center for the Study of Ethics. And David heads up our democracy program. Anything you'd like to say about the goals of this program, David? Well, um, it's an honor to be here. This discussion on democracy is part of the Utah Democracy Project, which is a, a three-year project um, uh, uh, centered here at Utah Valley University based on um, uh, uh, discussions on what it means to be, uh, live in a democracy and the challenges of living in a democracy and our, our responsibilities and, and so on. Okay. Uh, it's a result of a federal uh, grant. And it's been so successful. The different scholars and individuals we've been able to interview have uh, just been amazing. And that brings us right over to our distinguished guest for today, Dr. Mark Sagoff. And um, Mark, it's a pleasure to have well, you. Well, thank you, thank you, to, uh, Elaine, and thank you, David. And I, I too, want to thank the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education mm -hmm. and the competitive grant that allows this program to take place. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's wonderful. Well, um, let me tell a little bit about Mark. Every summer, just as soon as school's over, we have a summer seminar for the faculty, just the faculty, and we bring in a scholar of national reputation to talk on a really relevant subject. So that person is Dr. Mark Sagoff, and he's been talking to us ab about um, economics, global economics, and democracy, and ethics. And it's been a rousing seminar, and I'm so glad that we could have you as part of our discussions on democracy. And, and we've been studying the ethics and public policy implications of free market uh, economics. So you know we have to bring in a brilliant fellow like Dr. Absolutely. Mark Sagoff to, uh, to lead us in these discussions. And Dr. Sagoff is the director of the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy. He um, has published widely in journals of philosophy, law, economics, and public policy. And he also has numerous books, uh, The Economy of the Earth, Philosophy, Law, and the Environment was published in 1988. He also has um, several other publications, and he, he writes a lot of grants. He's uh, received <laughs> grants from National Institutes for Health, uh, National Science Foundation, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, and Pew Charitable Trust. You know, when you see a big title like Public Policy Implications of Free Market Economics, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Where, where would you start? in teaching a, a group of faculty or other interested citizens about free market Well, economics. you want to talk about the relationship between the market and the state, and everyone knows that you can't have one without the other. Uh, plainly, the, the government has to enforce property rights, rights of, of person, safety. Uh, but what more than that does the government need to do in order to sh assure the proper functioning of markets so that we will enjoy social prosperity. Okay, and um, you know, in, in 2008, 2009, uh, those were tough years for uh, the American folks, but they didn't just happen in a vacuum. We've had quite a few um, free market economic lessons going on throughout history. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the New Deal and uh, what was going on with free market at that time? Well, yes, we've all lost our 401ks, and so yes, we yes. have a, um, <laughs> a, a great, who did whatever we should do. We, we, we put our, our, our money aside in TIA, CREF, or whatever, and now it's all disappeared, and um, so as old as I am, I'm still working. Now, <laughs> this is not the first time the markets have collapsed. Uh, we had problems. Uh, Forever with uh, with um, booms and busts and and Ponzi schemes and and so on. But in the last century, uh, at the beginning, the big problem between the government and uh, the market was one of market concentration of power. That is what in the uh, Teddy Roosevelt administration was known as the power of the trust. And Louis Brandeis, would, advocating the Clayton Antitrust Act, would be an example, trying to. 
make competition happen in the marketplace and thereby break up monopolies. So antitrust was the big issue back in the early days of the, of the, of the 20th century. Well, do you think that this is still an important concept today? I know how important it is. No. Uh, uh, right now, we uh, have plenty of competition. Uh, I think the Japanese, the Koreans, <laughs> the, the Chinese, the Thai, et cetera, everybody's competing so that we have an enormous amount of the inventory and we're facing a possible deflation owing to the sheer overproductive capacity of the economy. But back uh, in the... Um, uh, in the earlier days of the of the t uh, 20th century, th that also happened in a way, so that and it led to the uh, depression. There was a a tremendous oversupply. There was a, a, even a housing bubble then. God knows there was a stock market bubble, yeah. uh, and uh, there were uh, there was a uh, uh, a lack of underlying value or a certainty as to what economics value, economic value was. And so we had, of course, the Great Depression. So the second big ex experience that we draw upon today is, of course, the experience of the Great Depression. What can we learn from that? And how, uh, how much are we in that kind of position? Will we be in that kind of position today? And, and David, what correlations do you see between today and the Great Depression? And do you have hope? Uh, I always have hope, and I can't get through the day without it. Uh, but the correlation that seems to me most timely and relevant um, is the, the relationship between free market economics and the degree to which government should or should not intervene in, in the market mechanism. Uh, are there, what, 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 um, what changes in philosophy did the New Deal bring about with response to the, the, the market collapse of 1929, and what did FDR do uh, in relationship to the, 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 the interaction between government and the state on one hand and free markets and capitalism on the other? Uh, the the, the uh, philosophy of the, of the New Deal was to uh, m both meet the power of business by expanding the power of government, but also using the pow power of government, of course, to stimulate the market. So what we saw in the New Deal was an enormous amount of public spending uh, for the sake of uh, expanding markets. But we began also to see a good deal of social regulation. As we saw in the, in the 1910 and 20, we should, we should mention this, there is a distinction, uh, if I could say so, between sure. social regulation and economic regulation. Economic regulation tries to uh, uh, govern markets, uh, stimulate markets, manipulate markets, uh, regulate markets for prosperity. So there'll be high employment, low inflation. We call that the, the misery index. Yes, you know, yes. okay, <laughs> that. Uh, social regulation is very different. That's environmental and health and safety. So the mines and the um, sweatshops, the textile mills, the railroads were very dangerous, as we know from the muckraking journalists like Upton Sinclair, who described in the jungle the horrors of the meatpacking industry yes. in Chicago, and many, many others. So one form of regulation of markets have always been you, sort of humanitarian, we call that paternalistic, so that people would not take jobs that would kill them. And at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, these laws, for instance, I've been, the most famous one was a, uh, a, an ordinance passed by uh, New York that required that bakers could not tend their ovens for more than 60 hours a week. I don't know if you've tended ovens for even a week or a day yes, or an hour. Yeah, it's yeah. hot. And these people were keeling over. So there was a, 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 an ordinance that said they couldn't work for more than uh, 60 hours a week or uh, some, uh, uh, 10 hours a day. Yes, yes. And uh, yes. this was overturned in a very famous case. Uh, Lochner versus New York okay. by the Supreme Court because it was considered unconstitutional because it interfered with the right of contract. So to what extent can we limit the right of contract between workers and employers, thereby raising the consciousness of workers in order to make the workplace safer and healthier?
Uh, this went through the 20th century and culminated in the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. Even by 19, in 1970, there were horrendous numbers, unconscionable, socially unconscionable numbers of deaths and injuries on the job. And the workers themselves were not demanding safety. It took the, it takes legislation often to raise consciousness so that workers will, in fact, begin to value their own lives and not individually think it can't yeah. happen you know, to this, me. This is something that I often talk about in my business ethics class with my students because um, we, we like the simple concept of the invis invisible hand and that uh, everything will take care of itself in business and that Adam Smith had everything just right, especially when he combined theory of moral sentiments yeah. uh, with his, with his um, uh, wonderful work in 1776. But um, the invisible hand hasn't worked very well, and we have had to have these, govern these government agencies come oh, in. I disagree with that in. entirely. I think the invisible hand has been absolutely wonderful. Oh, it just well, takes I'm a, glad you disagree. <laughs> it takes a, uh, what we have found is that there are excesses, and these have to be managed. One problem is market concentration of power or monopoly where there isn't enough competition mm -hmm. so antitrust laws are necessary another problem is that pe people make typically mistakes about how risk will affect them so we need to the government needs to deal with that we have obviously environmental problems where the the the, the costs of, of of production are including pollution have to be regulated otherwise people would be paying those costs to, in, by breathing oh, pollution. We, we agree completely and, on and, this. And, but, but the basic yeah. idea that the invisible hand will lead to prosperity, but there must be a, a government not, to, not only to protect the rights of person and property, but to deal with the bumps along the way, this is also part of the of the consensus. So the invisible hand needs to be slapped now and then with a few, <laughs> with a few red federal uh, depend, regulations. Depending on how you want to construe uh, the metaphor. Sure, sure. but um, as I talk to some of my students, they'll be against these different federal regulations. And then we'll start talking about, well, OSHA is written just for you. Here you are, 19 years old. You're going up on an unsafe ladder. Uh, you could very well um, fall, hit the ground, be permanently injured. You could even die. Um, the OSHA standards are actually helping you out. And uh, you hear your boss or uh, some other folks in power who might complain about some of these regulations. But Well, uh, that's a, it, it's a problem. How safe should ladders be? Uh, and that, by the way, is, is an example that has been really argued a lot. Uh, OSHA originally and initially just instituted the, the, the standards that already uh, the Chambers of Commerce and the uh, the um, uh, professional or the uh, industrial groups had already themselves sought to adopt because they didn't want the race to the bottom. They didn't want competition among themselves to produce the worst possible conditions. Also, they were, of course, afraid of liability and what a jury would do and so on. Now, there were some uh, uh, kinds of reforms you could make, for instance, in how the how thick or, or strong ropes have to be in, in scaffolds and mines that are either safe or not safe. I mean, you could make a rope that's safe. Yeah. And it's not that expensive. So those make scaffolds us, yes. goes, have to be that strength to be safe. Ladders are kind of a different matter because you have to say, well, how absolutely foolproof does a ladder have to be? And you can spend an awful lot of money taking care of very unlikely risks. So how safe is safe enough becomes a big problem. And how do you deal with that problem And once you've taken care of the really egregious and unconscionable yes. conditions, then becomes a very much of a political and economic uh, and philosophical uh, debate. So any, anything you'd like to add to this, well, David, before we move back to Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> and the Wilson administration? Uh, on the invisible hand, before we move away from that topic, it seems to me that the butcher, the brewer, and the baker are not going to come into market relationships with one another unless there's some element of trust. So it seems to me a misrepresentation of Adam Smith to say that the invisible hand in the market uh, operates autonomously and independently of 
of, of any uh, external uh, social uh, uh, context uh, that, there, that for the invisible hand to work, there needs to be some sort of pre-existing social framework, which I, which I would call ethics, uh, or, or a sense of trust or respect for one another, and that the invisible hand doesn't operate in a social vacuum, which is the sense I get sometimes from, from the, the, the free market faithful, but rather there needs to be some uh, some pre-existing social framework for the market to function properly. Well done. Yes, well done. Yes, well That's done. Right. Yes, I and and he. There's and nothing he, I said to disagree with. He, and you pulled together wealth of nations <laughs> and <laughs> theory of moral sentiments. Well, tell us a little bit about how um, the economy further changed during um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson's administrations. Well, there's as I said the. Um, there, there became an awareness of the necessity of active intervention, intervention by the state in the economy uh, to both create competition and to uh, regulate competition. The reformers of the 1930s and 40s were in a different position as they lived through the, the Depression. And they had to really, as is always said, save capitalism because there was, of course, at that point no longer an alternative, namely communism or socialism. And so uh, they had to uh, uh, make markets function primarily by stimulating markets, creating uh, public works. And a lot of historians say that this really would not have been successful but for the Second World War, which resulted in an enormous amount of deficit spending and a economic stimulation uh, and full employment uh, because of the, of the war. After the Second World War, during the 50s and 60s, 70s, actually the economy was good because of the rise of American power in the world and the absence of a lot of competition at that time from, uh, ja from Japan and, uh, Ch and China. Uh, the, the, these were for Americans prosperous times. So the problems we began to address at that point were more social and political, having to do with racism, equality of, of, of women, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and of course um, uh, improving educational opportunities, and of course the environment. So the great environmental movement started in the late 60s and early 70s. And, and let me just ask David, why are all these important to the economy? All of these different movements that Mark's just been talking about. Why How are, are they, they going to change it? <coughs> I, actually, I'm going after wages might change. You have to have oh. equal opportunity. We have to have changes in the environment for um, uh, those who are going to be coming after us. Yes, to strike a personal note, Mark uh, informed me yesterday that he moved from uh, Ithaca, New York to uh, Washington, D.C. because the federal government during the 60s had begun to break the gender, uh, uh, gender discrimination and uh, that there were a lot of young professional women that were being paid fairly well by the federal government. So s certainly social... I wanted to live uh, off them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, not so, sure this so is going social either. justice, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously... Uh, is going to have some some impacts on on, on the market. Uh, uh, some of the first uh, environmental uh, environmentalists came out of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. and they were concerned with uh, uh, what we now call environmental racism or environmental injustice, and that is the inequitable distribution of of, of uh, pollution to low-income areas. Let me try and uh, take an answer to the question. It's true that I. I moved from uh, Cornell to the University of Maryland, where I, uh, I teach now, uh, because I was a young man and um, uh, looking for a wife, and there were a lot of women moving to Washington to take the jobs <laughs> that they could get in the government and, right. and, and, and nowhere else. But um, I think that your, your question is, what is the relationship between the, um, the civil rights, the um, environmental, uh, the uh, 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 women's movement, and so forth, and the economy, is practically nothing. And this is really interesting because they did, uh, Murray Wiedenbaum and many other scholars during the 60s and 70s, excellent economists. Robert Rapetto is somebody who made tremendous yes. contributions and should not be forgotten. Uh, he's probably still uh, uh, writing on this. 
they studied the extent to which environmental regulations affected the economy. And what they, and what they meant was employment, prices, that is inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and the advance of technology. And they found that it was a almost even trade-off. Yes, environmental regulations cost some people some jobs, but they created other jobs. And they were forced technology in useful and interesting ways. Uh, they did not add very much to inflation. There was a lot of price stability. And what was generally found is that, say, in the Clinton administration, when environmental laws were the most strictly enforced, the economy did the best. And economists believe that's completely coincidental. <laughs> and that, these, <laughs> that, that when we talk about the cost of environmental regulation on the economy, they're pretty small, uh, and uh, they involve a lot of tr particular mm -hmm. trade-offs as to what jobs there are and so on. But uh, compared to uh, uh, technological change like the internet or computers or, or something like that, sure. it, 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 it's n nothing. Nothing. <laughs> No, there's no real effect. Uh, Ch you know, change is difficult for us, and these were all big change areas, but kind of um, a much ado about nothing as far as how it had an overall effect on the economy then. Uh, th that's right. The, the reason why we're in such a horrific economic decline now has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the Bush administration did not enforce environmental laws very much. <laughs> and the reason that we had a wonderful economy during the Clinton administration had nothing to do with the fact that they right. <laughs> Clinton did enforce environmental laws. These, this is the difference between social and economic regulation. So uh, social uh, regulation has to do with health, safety, uh, gender equality, r racial equality, uh, the, the quality sort of quality of social life issues, uh, whereas uh, economic regulation has to do with um, uh, uh, breaking up trusts and, and, and monopolies, stimulating uh, uh, markets, creating technologies that might you know, lead to whole new paths of development, uh, trade regulation, tariffs, monetary policy, fiscal policy, whether the Fed is buying back bonds, all of that sort of thing. These are really different things. Believe me, economic policy will impact the market. Social policy, like environmental, well, you know, it's interesting to study. It's not that great. Okay, well, are we ready to move past the Great Society and on to the Reagan days, or are there a few no, more no, things? No, no, that'll do. We should, we should look at it. what happens during, during the 60s and 70s, of course, particularly in the 70s, was this great rush of social regulation, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, many other uh, uh, statutes, and of course there was the Civil Rights Act you know, earlier in the 60s. So uh, at the same time, people don't, might not remember, there was an awful lot of economic deregulation. The name Alfred Kahn might mean something sure. to someone. He was the, the uh, Cornell economist who, who thought that the rare airlines should pr set their own prices, that is, be competitive, because back in those days, and I can remember, uh, prices were set by the government for yeah. airlines, and so the airlines had to compete by giving you be better meals. Now, of course, you have to pay for your own meals, but actually the, the, the price you pay is, 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 is lower. And the railroads as well, and, and, um, and freight and whatnot. So there was this period of economic deregulation during the uh, 60s and 70s, at the same time as there was a lot of social regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, by the time of, um, in, in the 1980, when, um, when Ronald Reagan uh, took office, the, the speedy and successful pursuit of economic deregulation uh, created in the Republican Party high expectations that there could be similar results in social deregulation. They, they thought that the ladders had become too safe. It was oh, yeah. too much of a burden on industry, all of this health and, and safety stuff, that industry had to pay too much to, to put scrubbers on their stacks or to, or to treat their wastes and so forth. That the Environmental Protection Agency that was full of car appointments, yeah, right? Yes. That, <laughs> that they were driving industry crazy. And they, so, they, so the uh, Reagan uh, administration thought. And so uh, David Stockman, who, as people may remember, was the director of the Office of Management and Budget, which pretty, uh, pretty much created during the Nixon and then Reagan administration take place, the old 
a bureau of the of the budget. Anyway, Stockman wrote this famous, does anybody remember it? Dunkirk memo, uh, 1980, when he called for a dramatic, substantial rescission of the regulatory burden and for a regulatory ventilation. So he wanted to cut back on social regulation in the same way that his predecessors had cut back on economic uh, regulation. Well, let me stop and see if David has a question he'd like to ask on this, or, or David, any of the the things that spring forward to you about the changes that happened with the Reagan administration and how some people still laud them today, other, peoples are, other people are still highly critical of them. Well, I <coughs> admittedly had not heard of the Dunkirk memo, but this seems like a complete reversal in regulatory philosophy <coughs> that, um, that had been building or <coughs> sustaining itself since the New Deal. Is that right? Uh, y yes, th th that's right. and. Uh, 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 Reagan was able to tap a lot on libertarian uh, and free market uh, uh, instincts, and he was also able to draw upon a certain amount of resentment because the ladders were, were really a problem. I mean, it, 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 OSHA <laughs> made made them them regulations too difficult, so you had a whole book on how you had to do your ladders. There may have been a need for uh, reform, and so in order to make this take place, Reagan did a very interesting thing from, our, from the point of view of our constitutional uh, structure of government. Typically, or always, the, um, the uh, uh, Congress, in writing legislation, makes the regulatory agencies, whether it's the Environmental Protection Agency or, the, or, or, or OSHA or the Food and Drug Administration or you name it, responsible for interpreting and enforcing those regulations. But um, instead of, uh, 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 but the, the, the president would have absolutely no power over this process short of going through the political embarrassment of sacking or firing the head of the right. agency. Right. So what Reagan did was he created at the Office of Management and Budget, which is in the White House, a centralized office for review of regulation where it had to get the stamp of the of the president's approval, and thereby took the authority to make regulations from Congress and the agencies, and brought it under the power of the of the White House. He did this in an executive order, the famous executive order, twelve two nine one, establishing a formal process for White House review of rulemaking, and this formal process required rules or agency actions to pass a cost-benefit test. I'll just quote from the executive order. Okay. Regulatory action shall not be undertaken unless the potential benefits to society for the regulation un outweigh the potential costs. The order stated regulatory objectives should be chosen to maximize net benefits to society. Okay, so David, is, is this a neutral order or do you see some ethical implications, negative ethical implications, inherent in this change where suddenly now Congress isn't making these rules, now we have uh, Reagan with an executive order? Well, uh, aside from the, the obvious power shift from the legislative to the executive branch, what is interesting to me is using cost-benefit analysis as a foundation for public policy decisions. Just the, uh, the, the, the optimism that you could uh, uh, tally up the, the pluses and the minuses, the pros and the cons, and make a, a decision uh, in, in a seemingly a quantitative and, and mechanical way like that. All right. Well, I, I, I think probably um, David Stockman, who uh, and, and, and those who ran the, uh, the Office of uh, Information and Regulatory Affairs in which this cost benefit might have agreed at the time because they regarded this as a pretty cynical move. What it really was was, uh, at the time, a way to just stop or slow down the flow of regulation. It allowed ex parte contacts, that is, people in industry and so forth could go and testify in the hearings at, uh, at OIRA. And, uh, and, and get another bite at the, at the apple. 
and the agency, the White House, could just send regulations back under this executive order to wherever they return to sender. So it, it, it was regarded at the time not as a splendid intellectual advance in which we were finally going to have a scientific way to um, make public policy, but initially as just a cynical way of adding another level of regulation in order to slow down what many Americans had thought had become a kind of environmental and social juggernaut. And you know, quite often, in historically with economics, we've seen a, the pendulum swinging. And sometimes it'll swing yes. too far to one side, and maybe, maybe with uh, capitalism in the early days of mm -hmm. industrialism, and so then the labor unions have mm -hmm. to bring it back over here. Maybe it swings back too far there. Then we end up with regulations. And now maybe we, with the Reagan administration, then we've cut back on the regulations a little too much, added another layer of bureaucracy, and the pendulum needs to swing again. Well, yeah, but there's an, a third factor, it's, what you say is true. There are academics and intellectuals and theoreticians, such as the ones assembled before you here, and economists and um, professionals who then began to see cost-benefit analysis as a way to empower themselves, at least as a source of funding. And so cost-benefit analysis after the Reagan years began to ad ad develop an authority of it, its own, and the economics profession claimed it had a certain legitimacy. Why shouldn't we maximize benefits over cost? Isn't the goal of social uh, uh, reform or social legislation social welfare and well-being? And when you use terms like welfare and benefit and well-being and so forth, it's hard to argue with that. But the underlying uh, science translated those terms into measures that could be measured, but had little to do, and we have been shown to have little to do, with any notion of social well-being or, or happiness or well-offness, measures of willingness to pay and preference satisfaction, and then an entire profession grew to try to measure willingness to pay, to try to elicit preferences, and this became almost a second way of governing, a way through, through social engineering, through scientific management, it was almost like what you had in the Soviet Union with apparatchiks with the right social science and the understanding the real laws of social change. We had began to be having more and more government by scientific centralized management than anything like the, the voluntary activity of the invisible hand. Okay, and then I asked a question in the seminar that you didn't like very much, but I'll ask it again. <laughs> so then, during the Reagan years, we have a proliferation of weapons buildup. And, uh, okay, I know, you've said we've always had weapons buildup, yeah. but what did this do to the Soviet Union? Well, they believed, uh, I, the, the, the example, of course, that comes to mind is Star Wars. Yeah. So there was a huge amount of spending in an absolutely um, unworkable, impracticable uh, venture of trying to shoot down uh, weapons, uh, uh, nuclear weapons. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah, well, Unless it, we knew exactly when it was launched. So it, <laughs> it couldn't possibly work. <laughs> and on top of that, <laughs> if anybody wanted to deliver a nuclear weapon to the United States, it would be in a, um, a container marked tutus or, you know, <laughs> bobbins or, or something like that. I mean, hundreds of thousands of container, you know, with these huge container ships. Yeah. God knows any, any nation with, you know, any kind of uh, nefarious in intent could put any number of those bombs in the United States and have control over them without ever using a ballistic missile. All of this was mentioned at the time, but there was a lot of um, money to be made oh, yes. in developing a Star Wars technology. So you had the typical uh, lobbyists for a needless uh, and very expensive weapon, something we, of course, see even today with the problem of the expensive Raptor. Uh, who's the enemy there, and so on. But what was so strange, and what people don't 
still can't digest is that apparently the Soviets believed this. Yes. <laughs> they took all of this technology seriously, and they thought that the United States had, you know, a real advantage. It was just sort of the reverse of the missile gap during the Kennedy administration. Right. So the Soviets began to become more interested in disarmament, in the SALT talks, and so forth, much more accessible. So it sort of worked, which just goes to show you, you, ne you never can predict anything. A and what happened economically with the Soviets at this time as well? Well, as we know, uh, the Soviet uh, economy was absolutely dreadful because it didn't work with the uh, invisible hand. It did not provide for a great deal of innovation as we had in the American economy. The reason that we, 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 we had uh, so much innovation is twofold. First of all, the government really did support the development of the Internet mm -hmm. and other basic technologies through NASA and so forth, and we got those into the economy. Whereas in the Soviet Union, these were these were protected. I still still remember in 1976 there was this big attempt to keep the Cray supercomputer out of the hands of the Soviets. Oh, and remember that? Well, it turns out that uh, now, and uh, so, uh, it seems so important at the time. I was um, getting Mother's Day cards uh, last uh, night. Uh, at Walmart, and they have these ones that have all of the singing and so forth. Oh, yes. Well, there's more computing power in one of these Mother Day car Mother's Day cards <laughs> than there was in the in entire the <laughs> supercomputer. <laughs> and there, you have to look at some of this history that was so torrid and so, uh, you know, frustrating and so dangerous. But, you know, we lived through it, and, you know, we can almost laugh at it. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Well, so um, let me see. George Bush was the vice president to Reagan the whole time That's Reagan right. was in office, and then That's he went right. on for four years. Any changes between uh, Reagan and, and Bush one? Well, Bush, uh, uh, Bush one uh, continued the um, uh, uh, trying to bring uh, uh, regulatory review uh, within the White House, but he did not use it so much as a way to. Uh, as, as a bureaucratic delay on regulation, but at that point, all kinds of environmental agencies and uh, like the EPA and so forth, and NGOs, non-governmental groups like the Environmental Defense Fund or the NRDC and so forth, everybody staffed up with economists so that they could write these cost-benefit analyses, and so you had all kinds of dueling cost-benefit analyses. It just became another vocabulary to express your political views. You could always find preferences to price. And the big intellectual breakthrough happened in uh, an essay by P uh, Paul Crutilla in 1962, I believe, uh, Conservation Revisited, in which he explained or, or advised that moral, political, and ethical views like I believe that God created the wilderness and therefore we ought to preserve certain national parks as a as, you know, testimony to our faith. And so, these, these goals, uh, now called commitment values or ideal regarding values, they had nothing to do with personal welfare. I may believe this and, and have, had nothing to do with, with my being better off or my being benefited, that we could put prices on all of these by asking how much people are willing to pay for the mere knowledge that the <laughs> Grand Canyon isn't polluted or that, that you know, the, the, the cemetery ridge at uh, the Gettysburg, Gettysburg is, you know, is considered a sacred place and they don't put, you know, uh, Johnny on the spots on it or whatever. And so all moral and aesthetic and cultural values they had nothing to do with personal welfare, well, mm -hmm. began to get priced, and the environmentalists began to buy into it, because if every American household is willing to pay a dollar fifty to protect the whippersnatcher or whatever, then you get these huge numbers. So the environmentalists had numbers, and the MacArthur Foundation, many other foundations, began to pour money at economists to green their science, and they greened it in more ways than one, to attach flabbergasting <laughs> values to all of these uh, ethical and uh, moral and cultural and spiritual principles. So the whole thing just got completely out of hand. And is that about the time you were writing your dissertation, David? What, ha, ha, was it an exciting time for you when you saw some of these uh, environmental values really taking on an economic value? 
yeah. as well as a social value. Well, it, it's uh, part of what Mark is talking about occurred at the University of Georgia, and the famous ecologist Eugene Odom um, actually did fabricate cost-benefit analyses in which he stood in front of the Georgia State Legislature and argued that these ecosystem islands off of the coast of Georgia, you know, had 1.2 million dollars worth of of, of, of monetary benefit, um, and and you know I, I at the time I thought that uh, that there might be some utility in this this uh, per, uh, per, per, uh, process because if you stand in front of a legislature and argue that an ecosystem has spiritual or intrinsic value, people's eyes are going to glass over and they're going to fall asleep. And they're, they, but but you know apparently there was a belief that numbers matter. But Mark just pointed out that you can always do a cost-benefit analysis to back up your pre-existing uh, political agenda. So you the, get the, the willingness the, to pay. You're willing to right, pay for it. So, so, so the the concrete uh, outcome of the, the 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 triumph of the cost-benefit analysis may be less substantive than than one might think. Uh, you just hire the right economist and tell them the end result you want and then they figure out how to 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 you know do the accounting and come and up with exactly the answer. How it happened almost the like agency. expert testimony in in court you know and it was uh, you had dueling cost benefit analyses in court off by an order of magnitude cost benefit analyses are not replicable you can't if if two separate sets of economists do a cost benefit analysis for the same regulation there's no reason to think they'll come up with any they like the same estimates. These are not replicable experiments in a but scientific sense. It was sense. a great time to hire an economist. People could get a major in, e in economics and look at all the jobs out there. And that's exactly right. <laughs> and I, and I, the economist. <laughs> yeah, good time for the economist. And I, I like your well, example too, David, where uh, uh, the economist could argue how much money uh, this environmental preservation would bring in, and it probably as well as jobs too. W without naming names, um, <laughs> there is some evidence that ecologists uh, fabricated cost-benefit analyses that weren't based in reality, but they sounded good. I can't imagine and, any uh, economist would do that. <laughs> no, eco ecologists. No, I know. Uh, I heard you say What the agencies did, e e EPA would figure out what the regulation had to be based on the law and you know what the, uh -huh. the authority Congress had given them the political reality and what con and then having come up with a regulation then they would bring in their economists to paper it over with a cost benefit analysis and so it became a again a very cynical exercise and uh, it continued uh, during the uh, uh, Clinton administration. Clinton revised uh, uh, the, the uh, and softened the executive order uh -huh. at the, the, uh, that uh, Reagan had instituted. Uh, and eventually it just became, uh, in the Clinton administration, largely a paper exercise. But it still began, uh, hopefully, to serve the purpose of making regulation a little more transparent and making the agencies really say the reasons. Uh -huh. uh, and th th there was a um, very important case, the American trucking uh, case. If I'm yes, not yes. And um, uh, there, um, it, it was a question of, um, of uh, re regulations on the exhaust of trucks mm -hmm. and how little, how much, and so forth. And the, uh, the EPA found some reduction that they thought was technically feasible and so forth. And the industry sued. And it went to the, uh, as environmental uh, regulations are always do, to the D.C. Circuit Court. And there, uh, Judge Stephen Williams said, you know, the law just says that, it, that the, the pollution should be limited to a point where the, it is safe with an adequate margin of safety. What does this mean? This could mean anything from the, as, as he said, from the allowing some, some smog at the level of the 1952 London blackout to a perfectly pristine uh, environment where you couldn't have trucks at all. 
Congress was so vague, said uh, 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 Judge Williams, that he, that he wanted to void the law for vagueness because instead of making legislation, the Congress had made legislators. Yeah. They had just transferred all their authority to the agency and therefore derivatively to the courts because everybody was going to always sues. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the courts are sick of making the regulation. They had, didn't have the authority. So that really became a reason for regulatory review at the White House because if it could get the agencies to explain the reasons that they had regulated as they had with some kind of principle. Incidentally, well, uh, Judge Williams in, in a, um, this was a tribunal, uh, uh, was trying to avoid the Clean Air Act and every other environmental law uh, because of the same reason for vagueness, as something that Ted Lowy had called for uh, in um, yeah. the end of liberalism because the laws were also yes. vague. He was overturned by the Supreme Court in, uh, in, a, in a kind of a humorous way. <laughs> but the, the lesson is still learned. We need to have clarity in the reasons for regulation. Now, this clarity might not be achieved through translating everything into willingness to pay and hiring economists, but clarity, transparency, reasons for regulation cannot be derived from the laws, which are open-ended, aspirational, precatory, and vague. So regulatory review at the Office of Management and Budget and, and at the Office of uh, Information Regulatory um, Analysis is still, uh, still called for and still appropriate. Yeah, well now with our continuing saga, we move into the George W. Bush era. And, and what happened with all of this in the, in the Bush era? Well, in the Bush era, uh, it was like the Reagan era. Uh, George uh, W. Bush wanted to uh, rescind regulation, push back regulation. And so after, uh, it, it was not, however, his top priority. His top priority is going to war in Iraq. And so it, oh, he was only got around to working on this by 2007. Oh, and then he, he, I didn't realize that. Uh, he instituted uh, a new regulatory, uh, a new executive order to govern regulatory review with the Office of Management and Budget, 13422, I believe was the number, in which he returned it much more to the Reagan era insistence uh, that net benefits were going to be the goal of regulation, cost benefit analysis for major regulations and for guidance documents are also important issued by agencies as to the meanings of terms, would have to be reviewed under a cost-benefit test, and insofar as the law allowed, everything had to be justified in terms of a market failure. Uh -huh. So it was a clear call for every economist to get on deck and to keep keep um, uh, regulations down by flooding them, uh, by, by, by drowning them, I should say, mm -hmm. in, in technical analysis. So there, and there was an enormous uh, kind of outcry between lawyers and economists about this executive order with the lawyers hating it and the economists loving it. Huge discussion in about 2008 of this, this, this jazzing up of the regulatory review just in time for the election of Barack Obama. Yeah, so um, some economists, um, and, and David, add any questions that you might have or answers. Some economists were saying we should have seen this collapse by 2004, that it was quite evident it was coming. But, um, you know, it, the summer of 2008, when I saw Bear Stearns collapse, I thought this was just um, an isolated incident. Then um, I was teaching business ethics that fall, we were reading the New York Times every day in class, and every day I was saying, but this is unprecedented. This failure is unprecedented. This financial failure is unprecedented. And uh, it just seemed like uh, it was such a, a cascading uh, uh, problem that it looked like uh, we were going to have an entire bankrupt nation. Uh, actually, this has to do with, re with economic regulation, not with. So we were talking about the executive orders. They had to do with health and safety, e food and drug administration, occupational health and safety, all of these social goals. Sure, sure. And uh, this turns out, as I suggested before, to be quite independent of the business cycle. Okay. So it had nothing to do with the bubble in in housing. We had okay. Housing bubbles. These housing bubbles were uh, uh, continued. There's a uh, Richard Posner's points this out in this new book, and, and uh, 
and articles uh, because the Federal Reserve under Greenspan kept interest rates so low that people could borrow and leverage and leverage, and there was a lot of over leveraging. It had absolutely nothing to do with environmental or social regulation. So we really do have two quite different and independent tracks. Um, it, I think it's very plausible to say that the social progress we make to become a cleaner, fairer, more equitable, safer, more socially responsible society with respect to things like pollution and equal opportunity and so forth really doesn't affect stuff like housing bubbles mm -hmm. and, and you know, complex uh, uh, credit default swaps and uh, mortgage-backed securities. And that, that's economic regulation right. and how you regulate the banks and so on. Uh, this, these are two different Very tracks. Different. Well, well, let's just stay on that social regulation. And, and why don't you tell us uh, about global climate change? Does the U.S. have a responsibility? Because during the Bush administration, then it was no. Now, during the Obama administration, it's, it's yes. Where, where are you on this one? And uh, David, maybe yeah, you maybe. can let us know too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yes. um, you know, uh, one gets the impression. Uh, at times that uh, there are good arguments uh, for the U.S. to take action to mitigate global climate change because after all, you know, we're, we're told that we are the prime producers of CO2 and the most vulnerable nations, uh, the, the, the equatorial nations, the low-lying nations, the nations in coastal areas that have very little to do with global warming are the ones that are going to suffer the most. Um, so, so there are there are some some there seem to be some strong ethical arguments uh, uh, <clears throat> arriving at the conclusion that the U.S. has a moral responsibility to mitigate our own uh, uh, emission of greenhouse gases. But I'm curious, Mark, uh, what are some of the problems with uh, the U.S. taking action? Uh, uh, you know, why why should uh, what, why should we uh, not be as alarmed, perhaps, as uh, as um, those <coughs> environmentalists say we should. Uh, well, it, it's uh, it's the case that uh, climate change has become the 800-pound gorilla in the environmental uh, movement, and uh, in, in a way, this is unfortunate because uh, it's not so much an environmental problem. I mean, it is a uh, energy problem largely, and it's a trade problem, as, we, as we'll see. It's a transportation problem. It's industrial problem. Uh, it's it's to ch we have to change the way we produce and deliver goods to make them more environmentally friendly, but also uh, uh, just to produce fewer greenhouse gases. This becomes a problem that just reaches into all kinds of world affairs, and it's not easy to see how to solve it. As is often noted, it, China now produces more greenhouse gases than the United States. India is right up there, and India is one of the countries that's going to suffer the most, incidentally. And then there's Brazil, and it goes on and on. And these producing countries say they sell their stuff to America, and so we get the benefit of what they produce. But our American producers who are in competition say, well, we can't stand a tax on our carbon. We can't use more expensive energy because then we couldn't compete with the, the others. So they, they want tariffs or they want allowances for nothing. Exactly what happened in Europe under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, there was an attempt in, in Europe, that still is, uh, to uh, allocate uh, allowances to produce uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. But in order to get buy-in from industry, you had to get buy-out. You had to give Russian industry and Ukrainian industry and all kinds of European industries so many allowances that were going to have some financial value because they could be sold. That, and to bring in the, the, the developing countries, you had to have a clean development mechanism which allowed them to produce allowances because of changes they would make that would uh, uh, reduce their carbon from planting forests or whatever. It turns out that, that the allowances became so many, uh, it, they produced what was called a lot of hot air. There was more allowances <laughs> than, th than, than there was a cap, or even indeed than there was already pollution. And so the whole thing became a farce. And that's what 
that I, actually, I, uh, I think that um, that that economists in the, during the uh, uh, president, second president, President Bush's uh, administration foresaw this coming. That right. Kyoto really wouldn't amount to a serious effort to restrain. Uh, a, a global um, production well, of CO2. certainly was criticized at the time he backed out of the Kyoto pr Protocol based on the argument that mm -hmm. India and China as big yep. producers yes, are, were country. exempted. And, 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 and if I understand you correctly, there there is some justification for well, his... Well, Clinton, who followed... We're talking about the first President Bush now. Yeah. Um, Clinton, who followed did absolutely nothing. And this is a Democrat, this is a big environmentalist and so forth. But if you actually look at the record of the Clinton administration, it has no record on trying to control greenhouse gases because it was a, a politically impossible. You have to allocate, if you're going to have a cap and trade, if you're going to do anything like as, as complicated as that, you have to allocate allowances to, in the first place. And now we see in the, in the Waxman uh, hearings that are going on now in Congress, every single industry is asking for allowances. The paper industry in Maine, for example, can't produce paper unless it has allowances. And if it doesn't have allowances, the paper producers will be too expensive, and so paper will come in from those countries that don't have these regulations and that's called leakage, or make it for cement, or make it for any product. Every single industry has a compelling argument that it should be given allowances, and then everybody who's going to do anything that might have a positive at respect will just wait and not do it until he can, he can get a credit for that. So it sets up these huge moral hazards. The program itself is impossible to get going. It will not happen. So the problem is, how do you tax carbon or change technology in order to l limit and reduce greenhouse gases? Nobody has an answer to it's that question. A, it is a tough one. <laughs> and you know, sadly, we've run out of time on this. I think we can see what a very important topic this is to be looking at free market uh, economics and then those of us in ethics always wondering about how we can get those public policies implemented. A last word on it, David? Uh, uh, all I can foresee, it seems like uh, some sort of free market economics is, is, is become a background condition as I've heard you say. So, so certainly these issues related to ethics and public <coughs> policy, policy and the free market are something that are going to be with us for years, if not decades, uh, and into future generations. And you know, Mark, I hope that you will come back and visit us so that oh, we can have so more discussions well, about public policy because that's what your job's all about: is how do you mo how you move things from philosophy, from ethics to public policy. Well, thank you. I thank you both, and it's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us. Bye bye.